The first time I ever heard of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I had to admit it was the first time I'd ever heard of it. <laughs> and that, of course, is not surprising. I, as I was hearing about it in the context of being invited to come to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I thought it might be a good idea if I looked into a well-worn atlas that I kept at home in England uh, to see where Milwaukee, Wisconsin actually was. So that was my, uh, that was my introduction, and I came here just for a few days to a small church on Calhoun Road in Brookfield called Elmbrook Church. Uh, when I arrived at Mitchell Field, uh, the pastor of the church was standing at the top of the escalator that's no longer there, and he shouted down to me, I'm going to resign in the morning. <laughs> so I shouted back to him, coming up the escalator, don't do that. You've asked me to come for a few days of special meetings. If they start out with the pastor resigning, they won't hear a word I say. Tell them at the end of the week. And so he said, I will. And by this time, I'd arrived at the top of the escalator, and we greeted each other. Uh, incidentally, he did tell them at the end of the week, and some of the people at Elmbrook Church accused me of spending a week persuading him to leave. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. Well, of course, that when I was invited during those days to consider taking his place, I called my wife in England, and I said, how would you like to emigrate to America? And she said, what would we do? <laughs> and I said, they've invited me to pastor a church there. And she said, we've been hearing a lot about encouragement this morning. <laughs> she didn't understand that word. She said, pastor a church, you don't know the first thing <laughs> about pastoring a church. So I said, that is true. <laughs> and you don't know the first thing about being a pastor's wife either. <laughs> So why don't we come together and learn together? And that's what we're still doing. Word got out that we were coming. Word got out that we were going to come to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And the universal response to that in the United Kingdom was, where? <laughs> But the response in America was somewhat different. Uh, our very dear friend Cliff Burrows of the Billy Graham team called me and he said, Stuart, tell me it ain't so. <laughs> and I said, what ain't so? He said, tell me that it ain't true that you're going to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I said, it, I can't tell you that because it, it is true. He said, do you know that Milwaukee, Wisconsin is the largest city in America to which Billy Graham has never been invited? That he has been invited on multiple occasions to all the cities bigger than Milwaukee and to many of the cities considerably smaller than Milwaukee. And Milwaukee is the one city that stands out to which the Billy Graham team has never been invited. He said, I su suggest to you, you reconsider. Uh, shortly after that, I got a phone call from Alan Redpath. He was a, a well-known English preacher who also pastored Moody Memorial Church in Chicago for many years. He called me and he said, Stuart, is it true you're going to Milwaukee, Wisconsin? <laughs> I said, it is. He said, let me tell you, Stuart, he said, I've preached around the world 
but he said the toughest two weeks of my ministry were in, and I thought, I know <laughs> where this sentence is going to end. The toughest two weeks of my ministry were in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he then went on to say, and knowing you as I do, I'll give you 12 months, provided you don't get involved in a constitutional revision and a building program. <laughs> if you get involved in either of those, you won't last 12 months in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I kid you not. And then to cap all this, <laughs> people began to call me and say, Dwight L. Moody, you know, the great American evangelist, called Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the graveyard of evangelists. The graveyard of evangelists. Sisters and brothers, this was the characterization, this was the testimony of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 42 years ago, when we were first introduced to this city. I want to tell you something. It is not true of Milwaukee anymore. Amen. As we've had the privilege of living in this city, although not as often as we would like to, as our responsibilities are mainly overseas now, that as we've had the privilege of living here now into our fifth decade in this city, we have seen tremendous evidence of God wonderfully at work. And uh, one of the ministries that he has raised up here, and which he is greatly blessed, and which has had, in my understanding, a disproportionate impact in proportion to its size, is the Ministry of Basics. And it's always, therefore, a privilege for us to do anything that we can to encourage and to support the Ministry of Basics. Now, I wasn't going to say any of that, but <laughs> I've said it now, and I feel a whole lot better. <laughs> now I've got it off my chest. <laughs> now, um, you'll notice that I am a very courageous gentleman in public giving my wife the last word. Uh, the reason that I did that was she said she wanted to go second, and I had the last word and said, yes, dear. <laughs> but all I'm going to do now in the re remaining time is walk you through the text that was advertised as the theme of this morning together. Let me read to you from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This, of course, is all part of a letter that was written to a number of Hebrew Christians who had been exposed to the gospel of Christ. Now, because we have the benefit of 2,000 years of hindsight and because we are familiar 
with what the scriptures teach, we know full well that the first people who heard the Christian gospel were not ready-made Christians, obviously. Who were they? They were Jewish people. And these Jewish people who were first exposed to the Christian gospel were being told something incredibly unpalatable. What they were being told was that they had colluded to crucify Jesus of Nazareth, that God had then raised him from the dead and had proved conclusively in that dramatic action that Jesus of Nazareth was a whole lot more than a country preacher. He was a whole lot more than just a prophet. He was the son of God and the son of man, and those Jewish people were confronted with the fact that they had been intimately involved in crucifying the son of God. Why would they want to listen to that? Why were they not deeply offended why were, were they not consumed with anger that some hillbillies from the Galilean area would have the audacity to stand up and accuse them of crucifying the Son of God whom, Jesus, whom God had raised from the dead and declared to be the Lord of all? Some of the Jewish people who heard this, however, believed it was true. And when they heard this, it said they were pricked in their hearts. And they said to the people telling this unpalatable message to them, what should we do? They understood the message. They were deeply moved by the message. And they realized it demanded action from them. Notice, please, the three dimensions of a faith response to the gospel. It is, first of all, intellectual. They grasped intellectually the unpalatable truth that Jesus of Nazareth had died on the cross and God had raised him from the dead, thereby proving conclusively he was Lord and Christ. They got it intellectually, but it didn't just stick in their heads. They were pricked in their hearts. And when they were pricked in their hearts, they said, we cannot listen dispassionately to this message. If this is true, it will have an incredibly emotive impact upon us. Some would be moved to fear. Some would be horrified when they heard this message. Others would be overwhelmed with feelings of guilt and responsibility. Others would be drawn to the wonder of the fact that God in his mercy had sent Messiah, not the Messiah that they expected, but a suffering servant by whose stripes they would be healed. There was an emotional response. And the emotional response didn't just give them a high or a low. It galvanized them into decision. What must we do? And the answer came forth very, very clearly, unmistakably. Repentance is required. Acts of faith and demonstrations of faith are necessary. There needs to be a radical change of your orientation. Save yourselves from this crooked generation and anticipate that God will pour his spirit into your hearts and lives and begin to change you from the inside out. And on that day, 3,000 people responded. That's how it all started with these Hebrews. All right, now fast forward. Fast forward. And what has happened? Some of those Hebrews who intellectually and emotionally and volitionally had acknowledged Christ as Savior and Lord were now facing up to the reality of what it meant to be Jewish and to believe that Jesus was Messiah in the turbulent days of Roman-occupied Israel 
in the first century, and they were saying, oops. Oops, this is rougher. This is tougher than we had expected. Maybe this wasn't the smartest move we ever made. In other words, they'd entered the race, and the race was getting very, very onerous, and they were considering dropping out. They were weary, and they were losing that's why the letter to the Hebrews was written. Now, it's relatively easy for us to, first of all, study it in that context and find out what the author was saying to people who lived 2,000 years ago, uh, who were brought up, were born and brought up in a Jewish ethnicity and tradition. And we have to see what the author is saying to them, what it means. And then we're free to make application of it to us. Predominantly Gentiles living in the 21st century in the United States of America. And is there any connection? Can we make application of these words? Well, I would submit to you that if these words are written for people who are growing weary and losing heart, they are incredibly applicable to many people today because sisters and brothers, being committed to Jesus, more than committed to Jesus, being committed to what Jesus is committed to is not easy. And it's not getting any easier. And it is demanding, and it is challenging, and it is tiring, and we finish up very often discouraged. So what do we do? Now we can look into this passage of Scripture and say, what does it say now? What did it say to those people 2,000 years ago? Is this eternal truth? Will it be applicable to me where I am today? Tired and discouraged and leading a word of encouragement. Well, what does it say? Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, there's so much material in this passage, and Jill is champing at the bit to come up here, <laughs> so I can't even begin to get into it with you. But I'm introducing it to you with this hope that you will not just take a slogan for a lunch and leave it there, but that you will recognize that it is a slogan that comes out of a passage of Scripture that, des that deserves from each one of us careful exegesis, much meditation, because Scripture tells us something very straightforward. It tells us, meditate upon these things, and the Lord will give you understanding. We hear so much preaching that goes over our heads, we, know, we hear so much preaching that the minute is over, the conversation explodes on everything except what the Word of God has been saying to us. We're not very good at meditating on it. We're not very good at working on it ourselves. We want to be spoon-fed, and we want the spoons not to be very big. <laughs> Teaspoons, preferably. That's not the way you handle the Word of God. All right, very, very quickly. We first of all have got to recognize that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Now, notice something very carefully here. Usually that is interpreted as if we are runners coming into the stadium and the stands are full, and they are witnessing us in 
of, as we're finishing the race. That is not specifically what this means. There's an entirely different word for spectator, and it isn't the word for witness. That, that you will notice that Hebrews 12 verse 1 begins with the word therefore, and you know as well as I do that when you see the word therefore, you ask what's it there for? And it is there to link us to what has just gone on. And what has just gone on? Well, in my Bible, not sure about yours, but immediately before chapter 12, we have chapter 11. And chapter 11 is the great, great chapter that talks about all the people who are now called here the cloud of witnesses. And these cloud of witnesses and the word translated witness, listen very carefully, the word translated witness in the Greek is martus, from which we get martyr. And you read chapter 11, and what's it about? It's about martyrs. In other words, it is not so much about we are surrounded by a lot of spectators watching how it's going on. What it's saying is we are surrounded by the people who've gone on before us, and they were witnesses to Christ, and it cost them. And we are in their train. We are the 21st century representatives of those first century martyres, witnesses, who in many instances witnessed in excruciatingly difficult circumstances, so difficult that a lot of people were saying, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Now, since we are recognizing where we fit in this chain of events, there are a couple of things we need to do. We need to throw off everything that hinders. The word, the, the, the word there is literally bulk or mass. Now, the analogy, of course, that is used here is that of the person engaging in the athletic event. If you were to en en enter into athletic events in the first century in the Middle East, you didn't just show up on the morning. You had to enter into strict training that was supervised and you had to be certified as having completed the training or you didn't even get to enter the race. And one of the things that they had to do in strict training was get rid of all unnecessary weight. Because you don't enter a race drastically overweight. You don't do it. Now, this can be applied in many, many different ways, but as far as the actual Greek here is concerned, it is just talking about bulk, it's just talking about mass. In other words, everything that would become a hindrance to that to which you have been called and that which you have chosen to enter. Well, there's food for meditation there, folks. Let us throw everything off everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles. The two Greek words here are rather similar. One can be a word that means things that cling to you and you get tangled up in them. And the other word means that which distracts us. It's so easy to get entangled in secondary issues, folks. And the secondary issues are not necessarily sinful, but if they be entangled as so that we are distracted from what we are being called to do, then funnily enough, sin, things that are not in themselves sinful, that are purely neutral, become a cause for sin in our lives. And we need to do some meditating on this. Let us throw everything, off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Everybody's race is different. There's one marked out for you. Obviously, the Boston Marathon is very much on our minds because of what happened there 
just a few hours ago, where people finishing the race suddenly were exposed to lethal bombs being exploded and cowardly, cowardly attacks on their physical and emotional well-being. What was interesting to me was that this happened at four hours and nine minutes after the race started. Now, I don't know what you know about marathon running, but marathon run is 26.2 miles. You know why it's 26.2 miles? Well, because of the messenger originally in Greece who brought news of a great victory by running to Athens all the way from Marathon. <laughs> that was 26 miles. You say, where did they get the point two from? Well, one year the Olympics were held in London, England. <laughs> and you know what the Brits are like? They have to fit everything into what they want. And in those days, their queen was Queen Victoria. And Queen Victoria wanted her children to see the start of the marathon. And so they'd mapped out the 26 miles from, the, from Windsor to uh, Wembley. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, the queen and her children uh, didn't want to sit at the start of the race they wanted to be where they wanted to be, and so that happened to be 0.2 of a mile before the 26 miles. <laughs> and so, ever since, the marathon has been 26.2 miles. But did you notice yesterday that some of those people had taken four hours and nine minutes to finish the race, but the real runners, the athletes, they were already finished two hours earlier. People who run a marathon that takes them four hours aren't quite as spectacular as people who run a marathon and finish it in two hours and just a few minutes. But they all have one thing in common. They finish the race. And those people who finish the race in four hours and nine minutes two days ago, are probably as excited and as proud, or would be, apart from the tragedies at the end, they'd be as excited and as proud as the people who finished it in near record time. They finished their race. Be, set, be clear about your race. The race set out for you. Don't watch what everybody else is running. It's your race. It's set out for you. And make sure you run it with perseverance. And how do you do that? By staying focused. By staying focused on what? Wrong question. By staying focused on who? Jesus. Why? What's he got to do with this race that I'm in? Well, he is the author and perfecter of the faith that you are working out and calling it a race. He is the author of it. He is the perfecter of it. I was just thinking about this term, Jesus, the author of our faith. I guess one way you could put it is if he's the author, he wrote the book on it. <laughs> he, he, he wrote the book on faith. What do we mean by that? Well, first of all, he is the one who provided the ground of faith. It's not having faith, it's what you put your faith in that matters. And when we talk about running the race of faith, we've got to say, what are we putting our faith in? And the answer is the groundwork that Jesus laid, for he wrote the book on faith. And what that means, basis of my faith, the basis of my faith is this. Jesus was born, and Jesus lived, and Jesus died, and Jesus was buried, and on the third day he rose again, and after 40 days he returned to the Father, was given the place of ultimate honor and authority, 
at the Father's right hand, where he waits until his enemies are made his footstool, and one day he will return in glory to establish his eternal kingdom in a new heaven and a new earth. This is the ground of our faith. He wrote the book on it, but not only that. He is the author of our faith in that he personifies for us the faith life. And you look at the life of Jesus, it was a life of faith. He says, the words that I speak, they're not my words. The things that I do, I'm not doing. He says, it is not I, it is the Father who dwells in me. I came at his command. I respond to his call. I do always those things that please him. I come from him. I depend upon him. I live unto him. I will give a report to him. It's all about my relationship of trust and dependence and obedience and love to the Father. He wrote the book on faith. He is the perfecter. He is the author. And he is the perfecter. And what that means is he didn't just write the book on it. It means that he is now busy at work implementing the faith life in the people who are struggling and growing tired and discouraged. And he's saying, you can do this. You can do this. I believe there's one place on the Boston Marathon course called Heartbreak Hill. And on one occasion, there was a lot of strife and trouble in the, in the city of Boston. There was all kinds of racial upheaval going on there. And they were considering canceling the race because the race course ran through some of the more troubled areas of Boston. Wiser heads prevailed and said, no, we shouldn't cancel it. We should hold the event, and perhaps this will bring things together. And so they went ahead with the race. Heartbreak Hill comes at the point where many people hit the wall. They just can't go on. And it's a very steep hill, the last thing you need when you're hitting the wall. And because a lot of people are closet sadists, they gather at the bottom of Heartbreak Hill to watch people dropping out. And uh, on this occasion, there was a young man who clearly hit the wall. He looked at Heartbreak Hill and it broke his heart. He couldn't go on. And the people started laughing and shouting and jeering at him. Come on, suck it up. What's the matter with you, man? And there was a, an older man ahead of him, halfway up Heartbreak Hill. And he heard what was going on. And he stopped running. And he turned around. And he saw the young man and he ran back down the hill. And he said to the young man, put your hip on my hip. And let me put my arms around your, under your arms. And he said, come on, we'll take it one step at a time, and we'll make it. And the young man was white, and the old man was black. And the interesting thing was this, the jeering crowd was silenced, and they began to cheer. And that's what Jesus does. He is the perfecter of your faith. And he'll say to you, I started it, and I'm going to finish it. And you and I are going to do it together. Therefore, don't lose heart, and don't grow weary. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter 